On March 8, 1862, when the CSS Virginia departed port and steamed out to the blockading squadron, consisting of five frigates, the face of naval warfare changed forever. The Times of London wondered about the future of the British naval supremacy, since the proud country had only one ship, HMS Warrior, to put against these ironclad vessels. The Times said pointedly, The face that nine-tenths of the British Navy has been rendered comparatively useless was concerning. The contemporary overreactions aside, this episode will explore how modern and impactful the War of the Rebellion was on naval warfare. The Battle of Hampton Roads was a watershed moment that put wood against iron with a clear winner. The CSS Virginia was a captured hull of the U.S. Navy from the Gooseburg Naval Yard, now Norfolk Naval Shipyard, in Portsmouth, Virginia. The rebels had equipped the vessel with iron plating from Tredegar Ironworks, but the Virginia was severely underpowered and deep in the water. As news of the Iron Cloud project reached Washington, Naval planners became desperate to find a counter to this danger. Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells solicited ideas for an ironclad program. While not an original submitter of a proposal, John Erickson was asked for his input as a well-known naval architect. He came up with a low-lying vessel with a massive turret and two cannons, a small vessel with impressive firepower. After only 100 days of construction, the USS Monitor was ready and arrived in Hampton Roads for the second day of the battle, the first engagement that put iron-plated vessels against each other, which newspapers at home and abroad recognized as a revolutionary moment in naval warfare. How revolutionary and modern was this engagement? The Virginia was blown up by its own crew a few weeks later to avoid the ship from falling into U.S. hands during George B. McClellan's Peninsula campaign. The Monitor had a worse fate, sinking in heavy seas off the coast of North Carolina. These vessels were imposing and could certainly cause serious damage to wooden warships, but they were not seaworthy and restricted to calm coastal waters for their operations. Similarly, as the advance in April 1863 by 10 Monitor-type ships into Charleston Bay indicated, these vessels were not able to overcome the concentrated, stationary fire from coastal batteries. The innovation of iron was limited. Nothing that the U.S. and rebels during the War of the Rebellion did was modern. The French Navy had launched Gloire in 1859. Gloire was an ocean-going, iron-clad vessel. The ship was a combination of the old and new. The 5,600 tons vessel had received iron plating 12 cm thick around the vessel, nailed on top of the 43 cm timber of the hull. While still maintaining a sailing rigging, Loire also had steam power that could give her speeds of 10 to 13 knots. Initially, Loire had a frigate-type broadside armament, eventually replaced with breech-loading cannons. The vessel never saw action and quickly the idea of iron plating died. 
Similar to the French, the Royal Navy too decided to try iron plating with HMS Warrior. The Warrior was similar to Gloire as a screw-driven steamer with a speed of 11 to 14 knots, but also capable of sailing. The ship was similar to his frigate in size. At 420 feet in length and 58 in width, she weighed 6,109 tons. The ship was not like some of the rebel-constructed vessels capable of doing ramming maneuvers, however. She was designed as a typical warship, and the casual observer would likely not have noticed the most deadly part of the warrior. The crew of over 700 sailors, marines and officers had 40 cannons of various calibers on board to fight. The most important aspect of the ship was its 4.5 inch of iron plating over 18 inch of hardwood. Both Great Britain and France were in the developmental process of modern ironclad vessels well before the War of the Rebellion. All powers had learned their lesson during the Crimean War, when they had used floating batteries during the siege of Sevastopol. With armor around these batteries, it was not a big step to consider adding iron plating to ships. However, the shock of the Virginia destroying wooden vessels should not have been, especially in Great Britain. After all, the British knew all too well about the superiority of iron-protected ships. In 1839, the British East India Company commissioned William Laird of the Birkenhead Shipyards and Iron Works to construct an iron warship, the Nemesis. The ship was only 184 feet in length and 29 feet wide. It did not have screw propulsion like Warrior and Gloire, but a paddle wheel was a draft of only six feet. Nemesis was designed for coastal and river warfare. She had watertight bolt heads, which helped her survive trials, the voyage to Asia, and combat. Nemesis showed his combat ability and the power of her six cannons during the first opium war with China. During the second battle of Chongpin on January 7, 1841, Nemesis got her baptism of fire. The ship performed well during battles the following months and helped with the capture of Guangzhou, March 18, in large part because her shallow draft allowed her to go up the rivers. During the battle of the first bar, on February 27, 1841, Nemesis defeated and sank a wooden armed merchant ship with its own illustrious career. Therefore, any surprise that Virginia was able to sink two wooden frigates should not have been. The power of iron over wood was clear as early as 1841. However, most European naval planners likely did not pay, atten pay much attention to a company-owned warship sinking a Chinese manned European built merchant vessel. However, the lesson was clear. The War of the Rebellion provided an important reminder of this superiority. Virginia and Monitor provided a powerful reminder that iron was the near future for naval construction, and the proud Napoleonic War era frigates and mans of war were the dinosaurs headed for extinction. Thank you for watching this episode of the War of the Rebellion channel. If you liked the material covered, please like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell for new episodes. If there's a story of the War of the Rebellion you would like covered, please leave a comment. Use the comments to engage in conversations. Thank you for patronizing the War of the Rebellion channel.